In July 2018, Nintendo filed a lawsuit against websites Love ROMs and Love Retro, dealing a massive blow to the gaming emulation scene. It's one of the first lawsuits of its kind in the online ROM space, and Nintendo is out for blood, seeking over $100 million in damages and the identities of everyone who uploaded ROMs to those sites. While it's unlikely the suit will actually go to court, we've already seen the ripple effects. A few weeks after the suit's filing, beloved 18-year-old ROM hosting site Emu Paradise voluntarily purged their site of all video game ROMs. If you aren't familiar, MU Paradise was considered one of the safest hubs for downloading ROMs. It was relatively light on advertising and focused more on sharing the history of gaming. This was a move that not only protected the owners of the website from lawsuits, but also protected the identities of the people who contributed ROMs. People Nintendo would call pirates. People who are about sharing the history. ROMs and ROM sites will never be fully eliminated, but pushing them deeper into the shadows has far-reaching ramifications. Let's be clear, this isn't the first time Nintendo has sued someone for copying their content. They're infamously litigious. But up until now, they, like their peers, mostly just sent takedown notices. Suits this punitive haven't been standard practice since the days of Napster, but we could see it happening more because it was effective. Like three for the price of two. Regardless of how legally dubious ROM sites are, they still serve an important role in the preservation of video games. When these sites go dark, we lose a lot more than access to Nintendo blockbusters like Super Mario. There are hundreds, thousands of games that aren't Super Mario, that aren't going to be supported or translated on their own. Even the most prominent example of protecting and reselling older games, Nintendo's Virtual Console Service, doesn't hold up. At its best, there were only 94 NES games available on the North American Wii Virtual Console, compared to over 700 games that were released for the NES. That's an insane ratio, and it should concern you. Nintendo is completely within their right legally to do this. They allege in the lawsuit that ROM sites have damaged Nintendo in a manner that cannot be fully measured or compensated in economic terms. They can vault all of their games, and they can sue ROM sites into the ground. But the tragic reality is that some of these illegal files are all that remain of these games. The question remains if we're okay with the casualties, if we're okay with companies like Nintendo gatekeeping thousands of games under the pretense of protecting their intellectual property and their fiscal bottom line. This is Past Mortem, and today we're going to take a look at games preservation by illustrating just how so much of this young medium is already gone, and how much more it stands to lose. But first, I want to give a quick shout out to all of our Patreon supporters who make this show possible. Thank you. The fact is, is that if it were totally left up to game companies, a lot of game history would already be lost. A lot of it is already lost. It's hard to know the exact scale, but according to former Capcom producer Ben Judd, many developers didn't have a system in place for preserving a game's code and assets until the 90s. That means that a lot of games from the early days are just like, poof gone. It's easy to think that these lost games are the victims of companies chasing the next big thing, but it's more complicated than that. Sometimes they saved code and assets, but in ways that are prone to destruction, like storing code on reams of dot matrix paper. Yes, a game's entire code just printed on a giant stack of paper. There's also the fact that physical media is just in general prone to destruction. RCDs and carts just aren't going to last forever, and technology becomes obsolete. Disc rock is especially a very real threat, though sometimes it's not really anyone's fault. A 1995 earthquake in Kobe, Japan actually destroyed much of the original art for the early Castlevania series, though the actual scope of the loss has not been publicly shared. A lot of games loss comes down to company culture. Developers weren't exactly forward thinking in the early days. I mean, it was very common to see aliases instead of full names and credits, if games had credits at all, which a lot of them didn't. It's still a mystery who exactly made some of these old games. A lot of times the preservation of these artifacts fell to those people, the people who actually made them. There's a lot of examples of this to the point where it feels downright depressing. The code to Sonic Spinball, for example, was thought lost for several years until a developer just like found it in his garage. Echo the Dolphin is only around because a developer external to Sega thought to save it. 
Even a game as important as StarCraft was thought gone until it randomly turned up in an eBay auction in 2017. The Apple II source code to the original Prince of Persia was thought lost until Jordan Mechner's dad just, like, found it in a box. But fail-safes like this can't really counteract the bigger risks, like the actual closure of buyouts or just reshuffling of companies. One of the most prominent examples of this is also one of game's biggest busts, the crash of 1984. After the market fell out, Atari began unloading all of its design documents and game source code, and only a few of the buyers thought to save the contents. We're not talking ET in a landfill, we're talking file cabinets of design documents and source code either sold at auction for two bucks a pop or thrown into a dumpster. We have some insight into the design process of a lot of Atari games thanks to the people who happened to just like show up to the liquidation sale. And that's just one example. Sega, who went through a couple of major reorganizations in the aughts, has admitted that they don't have the source code for any of their System 16 or System 24 arcade games. These are some of Sega's most important titles, and wow, that is sad. The games industry is notoriously tumultuous, and it's difficult for everyone to fully know who owns what rights for which games, not to mention failed systems and games. The 3DO, for example, was an important part of the rise of 3D-focused games. So was the Jaguar, or the Philips CDI, or hell, the Engage. Who besides pirates is working to preserve those games? With all this uncertainty in games companies themselves, the fact is that ROMs and emulation actually do help companies in a concrete way. There are several examples of game makers using a ROM dump to sell games for retro audiences, from Jalico's NES Classic Collection all the way up to the big N itself which at the very least used .NES, a legacy piece of emulator software, to sell you Super Mario Bros. on the Wii Virtual Console. This is despite their hardline insistence that software like .NES is piracy and therefore wrong. Which, by the way, is actually not legally true all the way, but that's a lot to get into and we need to move on. The biggest way by far that ROMs help companies, however, is actually through the building of a retro audience in the first place. Console emulation wasn't widely available online until the mid-90s and coincided with a greater interest in re-releasing arcade games. However, the ease of using iNES and the later innovations available in Nesticle fostered a new kind of community in gaming, a community that did away with the kinds of play companies had restricted players to. Kind of like how sampling and hip-hop turned music on its head, the sudden ease and availability of using save states to perfect speedruns, to play games from different regions, or even for simple modding and hacking created a whole new type of player, and rebuilt the interest in these types of games. And let's not forget this movement was global. It allowed people from all over, from countries that didn't have access to these games, to people that just missed it the first time around, to play and experience them. Like... I'm part of a retro gaming YouTube channel. I'm very aware of how big an impact this had on gaming culture, on creating an audience for people like me. It's hard to emphasize how important emulators, ROMs, and pirates were to creating retro gaming as a niche, as a viable economic force. It's pretty crazy to think of how the games industry as a whole would be different if there were no interest in these retro games. I find it hard to believe that smash hits like Undertale would be possible if pirates hadn't played and shared Earthbound with each other. Like honestly, what was your first experience with Earthbound? I'm guessing that for most of you, it wasn't with an original cartridge. Hell, I live with this guy, and my first experience wasn't on a cartridge. Easy access to these games helps the industry, from budding developers encountering old ideas they can implement in their own projects, to the less theoretical proving that a market exists at all. After all, if so many were downloading these older games off the internet, this at least meant people would be willing to buy them too. Nintendo themselves are implementing ideas born in the emulation community all the time, from NES Remix to even Mario Maker. And there's also the fact that remasters and remakes are big money and have been for a long time. Since the Love ROM suit broke, I've seen a lot of well-meaning people argue that piracy, that downloading and sharing these ROMs online are crimes, and therefore unambiguously wrong. The fact is that outlawing something doesn't erase the need for it, or even make it wrong in the first place. Prohibition in the 20s is a great example of this, and I know I'm not the only one out there who downloaded Metallica. It's not really hard to find laws that aren't moral. 
If you're a corporation, copyright extends 75 years past the initial creation date, which means Donkey Kong, for example, won't be public domain until 2056. The reason people pirate is because game makers, and the responsibility largely falls on the big three console manufacturers, have for years failed to provide a good alternative. The game and console markets are built off of the idea of games and consoles becoming obsolete, and support for backwards compatibility almost didn't exist until the PS2 and Game Boy Advance. It's still lacking. If people want to play old games without pirating, they're left with spending huge sums of money to try to buy a game or system legitimately. And does that really help anyone? I don't want my money to go to some random eBay scalper, but that's the way it is because these companies aren't giving me a viable alternative. Again, even though companies like Nintendo have made efforts to re-release their best sellers, these services like NES and SNES Classic and Virtual Console only cover a fraction of the 1400 plus NES and SNES titles that were officially released. I've seen a lot of talk out there about the ideal solution, a Netflix of gaming. As a LimeWire refugee myself, this sounds particularly perfect to me. How wonderful would it be if I could play any game I wanted for a low monthly fee? And that brings us back to the Love Rom suit, or more specifically, the timing of it. Let's be real. This is happening in part because Nintendo is launching Switch Online in September 2018, which gates first party and some third party multiplayer titles behind a paywall similar to Xbox Live Gold, allows save backups, and also, crucially, will have classic titles available to play for a very competitive price point of $20 a year. This is a pretty interesting departure from the virtual console model and follows a trend that Microsoft and Sony have already been pursuing with their Game Pass and PlayStation Now services. Xbox is shaking things up even more by offering a rent-to-own model with Xbox One, Game Pass, and Xbox Live at about $22 a month. Sega themselves launched the Sega Forever service for iOS and Android in 2017. Even games' closest analog to a Netflix, Gamefly, was bought by EA this year because EA plans on starting a service where you play their games live instead of downloading them locally to your computer. That's a lot of major players making moves. But none of this will be perfect. All of these services being separated by company lines is incredibly unwieldy and expensive for the consumer who just wants to play games. These services are already so far along that the chance of a nimble startup like Spotify acting as a hub for gaming is just not possible. Again, that fabled Netflix of gaming? That ship has sailed. Netflix itself isn't like this. Movies disappear from it all the time. Pretending it works to preserve history is just a fallacy. We need a library, but efforts to provide that are slow and not always practical in the face of an industry that actively shuts out preservationists. Even for those gaming companies, for their compromised online stores, it's gonna take years to properly sort out the technical and legal challenges. What about licensed games like 50 Cent Blood on the Sand or Goof Troop? What about region-specific games that were only fan-translated, like Sweet Home or Mother 3? And of course, the games that no longer exist. Are they gonna use illegal software to bring these to the people? This illegal software from websites like MU Paradise is already the last line of defense for a shocking amount of games. If it were solely up to game companies, many games wouldn't exist at all. To illustrate this further, all of the gameplay footage used in this video are from games we already know are gone in their original form. Companies can't even be trusted to preserve their most popular titles, the very titles they want to sell back to us again. That's why games preservation is a community effort far bigger than the people who own these copyrights. Microsoft, Nintendo, Sony, and others offering some games for purchase is a good thing. We can't let perfect be the enemy of the good, and it's good for the industry and its consumers to have quality access to old games. However, for me, and for a lot of people, it isn't quite good enough. Before this lawsuit, ROMs and emulation had hit a bit of stability, and I do think we're gonna find some sort of equilibrium again. Pirated software is never going away, and as of the making of this video, it appears both Nintendo and Love ROMs are trying to settle, which is probably a good thing for all parties involved. Because these ROM sites do perform a valuable service for people in keeping old games alive. Because many games are already lost. Nintendo says that pirated ROMs have damaged them in a manner that cannot be fully measured or compensated in economic terms. But that's what they're trying to do to us. Sure, there's money to be made, but you cannot measure these losses in economic terms.
We're sure the story is far from over, but when the next big scoop happens, you'll know how it got there. For Derek Alexander and Grace Kramer, this is Past Mortem, signing off. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. Don't forget to follow us, to like us, to subscribe to us, all of that stuff. And also don't forget to show a huge thank you to all of the Patreon supporters you see on your screen right now. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you again soon.